All right, we're back to finish up. Um, so my goal in this video will be to finish 6.2 um, about partial derivatives. And then we'll also talk about 6.3, which is applications of partial derivatives. And that, if we finish that, that'll be it. That's the last topic we'll cover, which means um, in the last homework, homework 15 on my math lab, numbers four and five, you can ignore. Like I said, they come from 6.5, which we will not get to. Um, so if you just leave those unattempted, don't worry about your grade, I will adjust appropriately. All right, um, so we're talking about partial, deriv partial derivatives. Let's talk now about second order partial derivatives. So these are like second derivatives for partial derivatives, but let's call them second order partial derivatives. But we're dealing with functions of more than one variable now. And if we have more than one input variable, there are more than one type of derivatives to take. There, there are different partial derivatives that we are allowed to take. So if we take a second derivative, there are multiple combinations of those. So let's just talk about a two variable function, f, <coughs> excuse me, f of x, y, uh, like we talked about previously. Our first derivatives would be f sub x, and let me let me give myself some more space here. Uh, yeah, Did, didn't think this through beforehand. Uh, so we have our function f of x y. We have our first derivatives. f sub x which is itself going to be still be a function of x and y, and f sub y, the derivative with respect to y, that's also a function of x and y. Now these are our first derivatives. Now our second derivatives, each one of these we have two options. We can either take the derivative with respect to x or with respect to y. So the way we write it is fx x, so f subscript double x, that means I take the first derivative with respect to x, and I take its derivative with respect to x again. So x first, then x second. If I wrote f sub x y, that means I take the derivative with respect to x first, that's closer to the f, so that's the, the first derivative I take. And then the new function I get from that, I take the derivative with respect to y. And then we've got the same thing, but with y's. I guess to keep my uh, table organized properly, let's do f, y, x. So the variable that's closer to the function, that means that goes first. I do the derivative with respect to y. And then from that function, I take the derivative with respect to x. And then lastly, f, y, y. Uh, that's, I just realized I labeled this badly. <laughs> that's the du double derivative with respect to y. So we have four second order derivatives, or second derivatives. These four are our second derivatives. Now, if we have a function of three variables, x, y, and z, then I guess there'd be nine of them, uh, but we're just gonna worry about two variable functions for this stuff. So let's do some examples next. So for these questions, I'm just computing all of the first and second order partial derivatives. So my function for the first example, f of x, y will be x to the fourth, 
y cubed plus 5xy. I'm not going to write of x, y on all these. You could, but it's understood. If I've got f of x, y, then any of these derivatives will also be functions of the same variables. So f sub x, remember what that means is we're taking this function and we're treating all the y's as if they're constants, as if they're just numbers. So the derivative part's happening on the x stuff. So x to the fourth with a constant multiplier, that's going to be 4x cubed times y cubed. And then 5xy, y is part of the number, so derivative of something times x is just the coefficient, so I'm going to get 5y times 1. There is f sub x, let me do f sub y on the same line here. f sub y is going to be 3y squared times x to the fourth. So 3x to the fourth y squared plus 5x. All right, so there's our first derivatives. Now our second derivatives, we'll have four of them. fxx, again, now we look at fx and do its derivative with respect to x. So we treat the y's as constant here. Uh, well, we'll get 12x squared y cubed. 5y doesn't have any x's, so its derivative is going to be 0. So fxx is this, 12x squared y cubed. fxy is taking fx and doing the derivative with respect to y. So that's going to be 12, bring the 3 down from the y cubed, 12x cubed y squared plus 5, plus 5, right, just 5. Derivative of 5y is 5. <clears throat> okay, so there's our first two second derivatives. Now the other two we, we take from fy. So fyx is now we're taking this. We've already done the y derivative. Now we're going to do the x derivative of this. So the 4 comes down from the x to the 4th and makes this 12x cubed y squared plus derivative of 5x with respect to x is 5. So 12x cubed y squared plus 5. And then fyy is now we take fy and treat x's as constants and do the y derivative. So we'll get a 2 comes down from the y squared. That's 6x to the fourth, y to the first. 5x is a constant with respect to y, so it's going to vanish and become 0. So 6x to the fourth, y. So there are four second derivatives, second partial derivatives. And I just want to point out, if you look at this one and this one, they're the same. They come out to be the same in this case. All right. So we'll, we'll just take notice of that when it happens. All right, so let's do another example. Okay, so our function, say g of x, y is x times e to the y squared. So the y squared and the exponent of e. Parentheses if it helps. <clears throat> All right, so we want our first derivatives, g sub x is the derivative of this where we treat y as a constant. Well, if y is a constant, then e to the y squared is a constant. There's no x's involved in that part. So from the perspective of x, 
This is just a number times x. So the derivative is going to be the number, e to the y squared. g sub y. Well, now the x is a number. We're doing the derivative of e to a power. Its derivative is going to be e to the same power, but then times the derivative of the, of the exponent, which is going to be 2y. I'll clean this up. But x e to the y squared times 2y. Let's uh, put all the numbers in front of the e. So 2xy e to the y squared. So there's our first derivatives. Now we've got our four second derivatives to compute. GXX. So there we're taking GX and doing the derivative with respect to X. But there are no X's anymore. So from the perspective of X, this is just a constant. Its derivative would be zero. GXY is now the derivative with respect to y of gx. Well, from the perspective of y, that's a chain rule. So e to the y squared times 2y again. So 2y e to the y squared. Next, gyx. This one is a lot more complicated looking, but from the perspective of x, so gy is what we have already. Now we're doing the derivative with respect to x. From the perspective of x, perspective of x, this is a bunch of stuff times x. And that x is the only x in the entire thing. So the derivative is just the rest of that product. All those other things have, are constant with respect to x. So it's just going to be 2 times y times e to the y squared. And again, this is the same answer that we got here gxy is the same as gyx. So these are equal again. And as we see, for the most part, when we're doing, when we're dealing with nice functions, I'm not going to define nice yet, but when we're de dealing with functions that aren't overly strange, so just basic kinds of formulas that we can write out with uh, kinds of functions we already know, these mixed partial derivatives where it's gx f, fxy and fyx they'll be the same function almost always all right um lastly gyy now it gets a little bit trickier gyy well it's a, it's a derivative of this with respect to y well now there's y's in two places there's a y in the exponent and there's a y uh, times e to the y squared. So that's a product. So this one, we finally have to use the product rule to do this, this last derivative. So with respect to y, let's do the derivative of y first. That's just 1. So we'll have 2x e to the y squared plus, that's the derivative of, of y. So it's half of our product rule. Now we have to do the derivative of e to the y squared and leave everything else alone. So that's 2xy derivative of e to the y squared is e to the y squared times 2y. So let's clean that up. Uh, let's factor out 2x e to the y squared. We've got those in both of these terms. So factor out 2x e to the y squared times, from this term we're left with just 1 because everything got pulled out. From the second term we're left with y times 2y, so that's 2y squared. Okay. Um, Alright, so... Those are our first order derivatives and second order derivatives for this function. All right.
so let's um, do our application now. So this is 6.3 we're moving into. So 6.3. is essentially using partial derivatives to find maximums and minimums in a two variable function. And these are local, local maximums and minimums. Okay, so let's first talk about the graphical interpretation of what it is we're looking for. And so here's where I have to try to draw a few pictures um, so remember, for two variable functions, an equation or the, or the graph of an equation, the graph of a, a two variable function is a three dimensional picture. So if I have a, a function like this, z is equal to f of x, y, that's going to be some surface that, that's sitting out over the x, y plane. Um, okay, second attempt at a drawing. Um, So all right, so let's just leave it like that. So a graph, a graph of one of these two variable functions is a surface of some shape that's sitting above or below the xy plane. So if the xy plane's down here, then the height of my graph is determined by this function. Above a specific xy pair, we have a point with height f of xy. Okay, so the uh, a local maximum point would be a point on my surface. Uh, that's not good. See, this is a nightmare. All right, I'll try it again. A local maximum on for this a local maximum point for this graph is going to be the point or a point on the surface, which is at the top of a hill. So this would be a local maximum. So. To describe a local maximum, it, it's a point on the graph that's higher than all the, the nearby points. There might be other hills out here, or uh, the, the, the surface itself may slope upward and, and have higher heights out here away from this hill, but local maximum just means it is the highest point in the immediate vicinity. So if we want to describe it or locate it, we have to find the xy point where it occurs so that would be down here in the xy plane. So, so remember, there are xy planes down here underneath. And then this point here would, would be above some xy point. So directly above it, we have a, a point on the surface. So we have to find the xy pair. And then the, the maximum value, the local maximum value, would be the function value at that xy pair. Um, Similarly, we have local minimums, which would be like at the bottom of a, of a pit, um, the lowest point in the immediate vicinity. Um, so the question is, this is going to be analogous to stuff we did back in, in the chapter about ap applications of derivatives for single variable functions, which was chapter two, I guess. The, remember the process. First... We found points in the domain, so x values in the domain where the derivative was zero. Those were called critical points or critical values, I guess. Um, and then we used various methods to determine at that critical point, is there a maximum or a minimum or neither? Okay, so it's going to be a similar thing here, but it's 
slightly more complicated. Um, so let me let me define it first. So a critical point um, I'm worried about the grammar here, but it's not that important. A critical point is a, uh, an XY pair, let's just say a, a point XY. We'll say x0, y0, which is a specific x and y coordinate, where I look at the partial derivatives, the first order partial derivatives, so f sub x, if I plug in this specific point to my x derivative, I get 0, and if I plug that same point into the y derivative, I get zero there as well. Okay, so both of the partial derivatives are zero at the critical point. Okay, so let's think about what that means. If I'm at a point, so I'm going to try to We'll see how, how well this goes. We're at a point on our surface. What does it mean if the x derivative is 0? So the x direction, I'm coming out of the board here. The y direction, I'm going that way. So if the x, der if the x derivative is 0, that means if I'm standing on my surface at this point and I walk in the x direction, so I walk out of the board, if the, if the derivative is 0, that means my slope is 0. So my height is not immediately changing if I go in the x direction. That means my, my surface is going to be flat as I come out of the board or into the board. So it's like there's a, a horizontal tangent line in that direction. If I go in the y direction, so right or left, the slope there is also 0 because the y derivative is 0 at that point. So my graph is going to be flat in that direction. So at that point, it's flat in both directions. It's horizontal in both directions. So there's only, well, there's only a couple things that could be happening then. If it's flat in both directions, then that means my graph either has to be a minimum. So you're kind of changing directions from going down to up in the x direction or down to up in the y direction. So that'd be a, a, the bottom of a pit at that point. Or you could be at the top. Well, let me just draw three different pictures. If it's flat in, in both directions, it could be the top of a hill. These are three-dimensional pictures. The top of a hill, that would be a maximum. But there's one other possibility. So at a maximum, as you go in the y direction, you're going uphill, then you change and go downhill. As you go in the x direction, you're going uphill, and then you're changing downhill as you come out of the board. There's a third possibility, though. Um, so this would be a minimum, a maximum. The third possibility would be, as I go... Okay, so there's different different variations on this third example. Um, so there's going to be other pictures I could draw here, but one of them would be, suppose I went in the y direction, it's flat at the point, but maybe I start off going down in the y direction, and at that point I'm turning around and going up. So that's the y direction. It's flat at the point, but it's changing like this. Now, in the, in the x direction, that's coming out of the board. Maybe I start off going up, and then at the point I'm flat, and then as I come out of the board, I'm now going down. 
So that's, let me try to redraw this. This is what's going to be called a saddle point. So I'll, I'll draw a better picture. So it's a saddle point because it's it's shaped like a saddle. Um, so it's it's like this kind of thing. So at the point right here, that's that's where um, both directions are. Chain, but both the x and y directions are shifting between increasing and decreasing in some combination. Uh, so right at that point there, that's at the kind of juncture of the saddle. And the point is, there's, there's other ways I could draw it. So I, I could rotate this or flip it upside down. It could be happening different ways. But that's called a saddle point. Um, and the point is it's neither a maximum nor a minimum. Okay, so what we need then is some, once we've identified where are these critical points, so at what x, y combinations do we have, uh, der both derivatives are zero. Once we find those points, then we have to have a way of, of determining algebraically or, or an analytically from the, from the derivatives, um, what, is act what is actually happening at those critical points. Do we have a maximum, a minimum, or some type of saddle point there? Okay, so this is called the D test, capital D test. It's kind of the two variable version or two variable analog to the second derivative test for uh, one variable function. Okay, and I'll, kind of, I'll try to explain why after I've written it down. Um, so suppose We've got a critical point so suppose fx of x0 y0 equals 0 and fy of x0 y0 equals 0. So that's just saying this is just saying that this point x0 y0 is a critical point. Then we look at this, this number that I'm going to call capital D, it is calculated using our second part, second degree partial derivatives. And so what it is, is I take the, uh, I'll call them double derivatives. So double X and double Y. Uh, and I multiply those two things together. And then I subtract the mixed derivatives multiplied together. Uh, so I'm going to write this as fxy times x0, y0. Um, I could do it times fyx of the same point. But like I mentioned, for our purposes, the kinds of functions we're dealing with in all these problems, the two mixed second derivatives, fxy and fyx, they'll be the same thing. They'll be the same function. So rather than write it twice with, with the different order, let's just square it. So I multiply the double derivatives together, xx and yy, and I subtract the mixed derivative squared at this point. Okay, so at a given point, x0, y0, this will compute and give me a number. That number might be positive, it might be negative, or it might be exactly zero. So um, there are, uh, let me go through the cases. If this is positive, if D comes out to be a positive number, then what that tells us is F, the function F, has a maximum or a minimum. We don't yet know which one, but I'll get to that next. So 
has a maximum or a minimum at this critical number, this critical point, x0, y0. Okay, so now how do we figure out which one it is? Well, if we have a maximum, that means I'm at, the, I'll erase this picture, but if we have a maximum, that means we're at the top of a hill. And as I go through, as I climb this hill and cross through it, in any direction I go, my curve is going to be concave down. It's bending downward. So if we look at one of these two double derivatives, so say xx, that means I'm walking in the x direction. Well, maybe it's easier to make hand singles with y. y. Uh, so if I go in the y direction and I look at fyy, that is telling me how is my... Uh, what is my concavity as I walk in the y direction, which is left to right in my picture? Well, if it's negative, that means I'm bending downward, and I'd have to be I'd have to have a maximum. So we figure out what's happening. Once we know it has one or the other, we look at one of our double derivatives and ask, is it positive or negative? So let me write this down. Um, if f x x of x0, y0 is negative, that means we have a maximum. If fxx of this point is positive, that means we have a minimum. I wrote this with fxx. I could have just as easily used fyy. They'll give you the same answer, okay? Um, because, and you all, another question you might ask: What if it's zero? What if f x x equals zero? Well, it can't. If d is positive, we've got this product. If one of these was zero, this part, this product would be zero. Then I'd be subtracting something squared. So I could not get a positive number out of this if the first part's already zero. I'd get negative or zero okay and moreover fxx and fyy have to have the same sign because if they had opposite signs this product would already be negative by subtracting it would become more negative so if, if d is positive if, if the number d is positive that means these two double derivatives have to be either both positive or both negative so if d is positive you have a maximum or a minimum to see which one you have, you, you just check either of these double derivatives and it will tell you the concavity in that direction, just like the second derivative test for uh, single variable functions. Okay, so I'm going to erase this case, but that's our first case. When d is positive, that means we have a maximum or a minimum to determine which check fxx. Okay, let me erase stuff I'm going to change. So what does it mean if d is negative? If d is less than 0, f has a saddle point at x0, y0. Okay, so we can definitely say if, if d is negative, we have neither a maximum or a minimum. And in fact, we have a saddle point. Okay, so there's nothing else I have to say about that. Uh, but then we have a third possibility. If D comes out to equal zero, that's kind of the, the failed case. If D equals zero, our D test fails in, in the sense that it's inconclusive. If, if D is zero, we might have a maximum, we might have a minimum, or we might have a saddle point. We just don't know what it is from, from this test. And so we'd have to try something else, which we're not going to worry about how to do. Uh, we'll just take it as a unfortunate example where we can't completely answer the question. All right, so let's do a couple examples of using this stuff. Example, f of x, y, a 
equals 3x squared plus 4xy plus y squared plus, uh, plus 8y. So the question is, find any local maximums or minimums, or find all of the local maximums and local minimums. Okay, so it's going to take more than one board to do this, so let's, let's do it in, in steps. First, find the critical numbers, critical, uh, critical points. Find the critical points. For that, I need the first derivatives, fx and fy. So fx, the derivative with respect to x would be 6x plus 4y. Fy, the derivative with respect to y would be 4x plus 2y plus 8. So th these are my first derivatives. To find the critical points, what I have to do is set both of these equal to zero. I'm going to need more space. But I set both equal to zero and then solve that for x and y. Solve that system of two equations for x and y. All right, so I'll have to rewrite these. But <clears throat> we set our derivatives equal to zero. Now we get this system of two equations. I need to solve it for x and y. Um, let's move the, neg the 8 over to the other side. So I'm going to subtract 8. Let's multiply by 2 and, and cancel the y's. So multiply this by 2, we get 8x plus 4y equals negative 16. If I subtract this minus this, I'll get 2x, 4y minus 4y cancels, negative 16 minus 0 equals negative 16, so x equals negative 8. All right, so if x equals negative 8, I need to find y. Uh, I probably should just divide this stuff by 2 here. Um, I'm going to plug this x into one of these two. Erase some of my work to make space. Yeah, so I could use smaller numbers by dividing by 2, but let's just go with it. If x is negative 8, then I've got 6 times negative 8 plus 4y equals 0. Uh, that's negative 48 equals negative 4y. So y is going to equal 12. So that's a pair that together make both of these first derivatives zero. So the only critical point is negative 8, 12. All right. So we found the critical point, the only critical point. In general, a, a function might have more than one critical point. Um, but we found it. The next thing is we need to know what is D. Okay, so D, remember, was FXX, FYY, minus FXY squared. So I need my derivatives. So remember, FX was 6X plus 4Y. Fy was 4x plus 2y plus 8. So then I need my second order derivatives. Fxx is the derivative of fx with respect to x. That would just be 6. Fyy, the derivative of fy with respect to y would be 2. And fxy be the derivative of fx with respect to y would be 4. Um, I could have also done fyx would also be 4, but it's the same as this. Okay, so in general, 
these will be functions. So in general, D will be a function, and then I'd plug in my critical point into that function for x and y. In this case, though, all of my derivatives end up being, all of my second derivatives end up being constant. So what is D? It'll be 6 times 2 minus 4 squared. So that's 12 minus 16. That's negative 4. So our test says if D is negative, that tells us we have a saddle point at negative 8, 12. And since that was our only critical point, we don't have any local maximums or minimums. There's no maximum or minimum for this function. Right. Um, let's do one more. better organized this time. Um, fxy is x squared plus xy plus y squared. Minus 6x. OK, so our first step is our first thing we need is the is the all of the critical points. So I need my first derivatives. Let me write them up here fx would be 2x plus y plus 0 minus 6 fy would be x plus 2y minus 0 so x plus 2y okay so I'm going to need these again but to find the critical points I need to set both these equal to zero. So I'm, that's going to give me a, a system. 2x plus y minus 6 equals zero. That means 2x plus y has to equal 6. x plus 2y equals zero. Yeah, so, so just <clears throat> trying to be a little bit too clever here. I'm setting both these equal to zero. So each of these equals zero. Then to make things more uh, organized. I add 6 to both sides on this first equation. So 2x plus y equals 6. And now I have a system that I need to solve for x and y. All right, so let's uh, multiply the second equation by 2 to get the x coefficients to match. 0 times 2 is still 0. So I did this. Multiply this entire equation by 2. Now I have 2x plus y equals 6 and 2x plus 4y equals 0. If I subtract, 2x minus 2x is 0. y minus 4y is negative 3y equals 6 minus 0 is 6. So y equals negative 2. All right, now I need to know what is x. So take our y value and plug it back into one of our original equations. So 2x plus negative 2 needs to equal 6. That means 2x needs to equal 8. So x equals 4. So our only critical point is x equals 4 and y equals negative 2. All right, so let me erase that work. Okay, then I need my mixed derivatives. Sorry, I need, I need, I need my second derivatives next. fxx 
is going to be the derivative of this with respect to x will be 2. Fyy, derivative of Fy with respect to y would also be 2. And then our mixed derivative, fxy, would be derivative of fx with respect to y would be 1. Fyx would also be 1, notice. Um, so that means d is going to be fxx times fyy, so that's 2 times 2, minus fxy squared, so that's 4 minus 1, which is 3. So d equals 3. 3 is positive. positive value for D tells us that we either have a maximum or a minimum at the point. So we still have to determine which. And we do that by looking at either of our uh, double derivatives. So fxx is 2. They're both positive. fxx is 2, which is positive. That tells us that in the x direction, we have concave up. It, it's a positive second derivative in that direction, which means it's bending upward, so it has to be a minimum. So it's concave up, so we have a minimum. All right. All right, so that's, that's it for section 6.3. Um, so like I said at the beginning, home, the last homework, homework 15, has problems from 6.3 and from 6.5. You can completely ignore the 6.5 problems. That's numbers 4 and 5. That just leaves three problems on homework 15 from 6.3. Um, so it's, it's a minor section for our for our um, for our purposes uh, if you have any questions over it uh, send me an email if I need to I can do some more examples um, but like I said this should be the last of the lecture videos I, there will still be videos going over quizzes that I assign I will email you when I upload those to those links to blackboard um, Right.